Welcome to Commander Central episode 77, and today we're going to be talking about narrow cards and strategies, which are the opposite of wide cards and strategies, we'll explain more later. I'm Dana. I'm Max. (laughs) And I'm Chris. Chris just shakes his head. (laughs) So what we're going to talk about in terms of narrow cards and strategies are are ones that are really, really specific, and we're going to discuss whether or not they are too specific for Commander, and a good example would be something like Red Elemental Blast. Mm -hmm. So we will get into that a little bit later on, but first... How's it going, everybody? All right? We're good. It's going good. Same, same as always. Yeah. yeah. We're that, surviving. Did I ever tell you guys about the friend of ours, uh, my buddy's wife, called my wife to complain about his father-in-law? Wait, what? Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, so get, that get, seems get really the, roundabout. So Get the Venn diagram out. I got to chart out how this all works. Um, so my buddy's wife called my wife. To complain about his father-in-law. Okay. So her husband's father-in-law. Sure. So she was at their house, and she got up in front of the TV to do something with the kids. And she's like, oh, I suppose I make a better door in a window. And his dad looked at her and goes, no, you're more like an ugly minivan sitting in my driveway. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, uh, that's probably an awkward Christmas then after that comment. Yeah, after I heard that, I'm just like... That doesn't sound like his dad, but it totally does. Because there's a football game on, so I'm assuming he was just like into the game, and <laughs> he's like, just get out of my way. <laughs> Man, yeah. No, you didn't hear that. <laughs> what was your wife's reaction to that? She told me, she's like, is that something he would say? I'm like, I don't think so, but I don't know. <laughs> wow. Okay, right. then. So uh, that, that's your, our, our life tip. Don't say that to your <laughs> oh, I harass daughter-in-law. My, I've been harassing my wife about that like all week. <laughs> Like, she came over, and I was laying on the ground playing with the dog, and she, like, jumped on top of me. She's like, oh, and then my son jumps on top of her, and he's like, how's it feel, Dad? I'm like, oh, it's like an ugly minivan in my driveway. (laughs) (laughs) That's going to be your go-to now for everything. Yep. I like that. Any fun games this week? Max wasn't there because he was running errands. I was working. Is that what it was? You were working? I was working. working. Chris played a few games. Of course I did. You borrowed at least uh, two of my decks. You at can't in time. say, of course I did, like you've been playing for like the last <laughs> year on Tuesday nights. I've been playing for the last two weeks like I said I would be. <laughs> did you play Alesha this week? Yes. How did Alesha do? Uh, it did really well. I actually felt bad. I was playing against a five-color Planeswalker player, and I had him locked out with Alesha and reanimating Hope of Gear for Okay. <laughs> so I eventually just stopped and let him jam a doubling season and then like alt Tamio field researcher. And I was like, I could have stopped this, but I felt bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then he borrowed Talrand after that. Yep. That was a close game. Um, I ended up just winning with Drake, so as it usually goes. Yeah. And then I borrowed Sigarda for a late night game. Which I haven't played in a while. I've, I've been replaying it lately, but I hadn't played it for a long time. Yeah, it was like turn six. I had Sigarda suited up. She was like a 39-39 <laughs> uh, with double strike. So I attacked the guy's Elspeth, gained life, because I didn't want to like just start one-shotting well, sure. people. And my plan was to deck myself. Cause I okay. cast, then I cast Soul's Majesty, drew all these cards. Um, they ended up wiping the board, uh, including all the enchantments. I'm like, okay. So I did a couple other things. Cast um, Rishkar's Expertise, drew a whole bunch of cards. Discarded down because I was going to replenish. Cast Replenish, failing to realize the Eidolon of Blossoms was in the graveyard, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and decked myself. <laughs> but that's fun, too. That makes for a good story. Yeah, I was just like, oh, right. okay, I, I guess. Because <laughs> they're like, yeah, we just scoop, because you're going to just kill us, and I'm going sure. through everything, and I play Eidolon of Blossoms on the field. I'm like, oh, no, no, I actually, I lose. <laughs> well, I, I actually won a game. I don't think, I told Max the story, but I didn't tell you, Chris. I actually won a game with an infinite combo for the first time I've ever done that. You know, I wh- I made that same face, Chris. Like <laughs> what? Hashtag scumbag central or something going on here. In my defense, it was a whole bunch of cards that were involved, and it was enabled by a player who was milling people at the table. He was milling with uh, Ultra of Dementia. Okay. Um, and I and and I even land screwed. I had kept. I wasn't. I I actually made a tweet earlier this week about how you're an EDH player when you don't pay attention to your mull and keep a bad hand and have to vamp. <laughs> you have to vamp tutor yeah. for a land. <laughs> I, had a, I had a demonic tutor for a land because I wasn't paying attention. During, I like I made the joke and then had to do that this week. <laughs> That's karma. Yeah. So, so I hadn't been doing much for most of the game and I got to this point where all I had out was a hanger back walker um, and whatever. what's the, the two drop creature that you tap to put a counter on all your artifact creatures? Steel Overseer? Yes. Steel Overseer. So I, I, had, I, had, I had got it out when I was at two land on like turn five. <laughs> 
and I was still overseeing a few counters, and everyone else was like playing magic, and I'm not doing much. And I, I wound up getting out a Nim Death Mantle, and then Ashna's Altar, and I, I just saw the combo then when, when every like everyone else is about to go off, and the pieces were just all there where I could bring back. I, or actually, I cast a um, Junk Diver. Mm-hmm. I had just enough mana to sack the Junk Diver and a few of the tokens off the Hanging Back Walker. To when I brought back the Mirror Battlesphere that got milled into my graveyard, recast the Mirror Battlesphere, and then put the Nim Death Mantle on it and bring it back. And I didn't, I had Lightning Greaves out too, so I could put Greaves on the Mirror Battlesphere and swing out one person and just do the tap the, the mirrors for lethal damage. Yep. And then I'm trying to figure out if, if I could kill the other person somehow. And then I saw, I remembered I had Tezzeret out, who was in alt range. I'm like, oh, I have infinite mirrors. I can just alt Tezzeret and kill the other person too. Yep. They're like, oh, well, okay, that's like nine that's cards wonderful. to make happen, so fine. <laughs> Welcome to the dark side. I guess. I, that will never, ever happen again to have all those pieces in place like that, but it worked out. So, um, If you want to tell me I'm a scumbag for <laughs> doing a nine-card combo in a Veil of the Night card deck, you can reach out and find us where, Chris? On Twitter, uh, at CMDR Central, and I just heard we're at 1,000 followers now? We're at 1,000 followers as of yesterday. Tuesday night. Yeah. Or well, thank yesterday. you, everyone who follows us. That's that's awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Yep. Um, you can find us on Facebook, uh, searching us up, CMDR Central. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, search CMDR Central. Um, as I've stated before, YouTube is mainly content. It, it's basically just a podcast. We're going to change that at some point, probably by the summer, but we're not there yet. Yep. And you can find us online, uh, www.CMDR Central. Yes, indeed. Dot com. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes, right? Which is CMDR Central as well. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Oh. And we'd appreciate a uh, five-star vote there as well and a comment if you don't mind. That helps us get a little more visibility, which is great. I would love it if it was like you could vote stars plus give a thumbs up or thumbs down. I'd love to see like a five-star. And then a thumbs down. Thumbs down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a podcast. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> You can also find us over at Patreon.com by searching CMDR Central. And we have a handful of new supporters to give a shout out to. Yes, we do. So we want to say thank you to K- Cohen Mommersteeg. And I know I butchered that, so I'm sorry. Yes, it's been <laughs> a long time. <laughs> uh, Kenan Dive, Zane Thorpe, Jerry McCoy, Stefan Mosh, and Adam Webster. Thank you all very much for the support. We actually just picked up some new mics. We didn't. We, we ordered some. We haven't got them in yet. Right. So we'll be switching to some uh, a little bit nicer mics here in the near future because of all your support. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. And thank you very much. We are ten supporters away from the the one hundred cap for the from the vault giveaway. So ten more supporters, and everyone will go in a drawing to win two different from the vaults. Correct. I'm curious to all our Patreon supporters, do you want me to wipe the dust off my From the Vault before I send it, or no, it's send a, it with the dust? It's a little bit of you on there. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. That makes it more valuable, I think, on a secondary market. Because uh, I know where it is, and it hasn't moved in since I bought it, so I'm sure it's just covered in dust. <laughs> but besides that, uh, we do have some giveaways going on besides the From the Vault. Yes, we do. So this month on Patreon, we're going to be giving away a Ravnica Allegiance Bundle. Brought to us by D20 Gaming here in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Formerly known as Fat Packs. Yep. Yes. Yep. Uh, and then on Twitter, we're giving away that beautifully full art altar of the Leyline of Anticipation. Yes. Which we've got a ton of people that have, that have retweeted that. So yes. speaking of that, I talked to Mark, who is the, the artist, uh, the artist who altered. And he told me that the only reason that his Twitter handle is backwards is because he wasn't paying attention. Yeah. Three, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so again, we're going to be posting that image every Tuesday uh, yes. for the remaining of the month. As long as you retweet that, you'll get entered, and then we'll announce that in the beginning of February. Very good. If you want to get your own copy of Leyline of Anticipation, in case you don't win that contest, head over to FlipSideGaming.com and use promo code CMDR in all caps, and you'll get ten percent off of all orders, ten dollars or more. Yeah, we would appreciate that as well. That also helps keep the lights on here at Commander Central. And they uh, do a pretty good job of supporting us as well. Yes, they do. All right. I'm going to go up to Flipside right now. I'm looking for fiery confluences because no um, one in their mother has any. I actually pre-ordered four um, smothering tithes from them. Oh, their pre-orders are up now? Yeah. Boo, I need to do that then tonight. So so for the rest of the show, I will be on FlipsideGaming.com. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris will no. be silent because he's doing pre-orders. Uh, All right. 
Let's talk about narrow cards. And this was actually a Chris topic suggestion. What kind of inspired this, Chris? What were you thinking here? Um, I don't know. It just Max sent me a message and he said, any good show ideas? And I had to sit and think about it a lot. He was pooping. <laughs> That's right. always good thinking. I was watching anime. For anyone who follows me on Twitter, <laughs> you'll see like my like profile thing says I'm like a huge anime fan, all this other stuff. So I was watching anime when he sent it to me, and I'm just sitting here. What is it? What could I think of? What could I think of? I'm like, Red Elemental Blast was the first card that popped in my head, and I'm like, okay, so how can I make this card work into a topic? I was like, oh, this card's super narrow. Yeah. That's how we're going to do this. I, I would like to, this just reminded me of this too. This is always my favorite thing about Chris. So Chris is a nerd. Chris plays magic. Chris likes anime. Chris plays Dungeons and Dragons. Yep. And Chris looks exactly like the opposite of the dude that does those things. <laughs> He's got a chew in perpetually. He's got like yep. a baseball cap with a fish hook in it. Chris does not look like the dude that's am, into anime. I'm a huge outdoorsman too, so. <laughs> you are, you're right. Well, you're into the things that you look like you would be into yep. as well as you're a giant nerd. Yeah. That always, that always makes me laugh. Whereas well, Max and I look like nerds. We're just nerds. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, it's awesome being a nerd because, like, when I'm thinking about magic or something, I can be out fishing and I just have, like, deck ideas rolling well, through you're my mind. Sure, that makes sense. Like, instead of staring off into nothing. <laughs> so let's start with Red Elemental Blast because that's a perfect one. Red Elemental Blast and Pyroblast. And I guess we'll discuss Blue and Hydroblast as well. Yeah, because they basically do the same things. Yeah. Um, so first here, let's note those cards are technically slightly different. I always assumed they were the same, basically the same card, but they're not. Uh, the difference technically is on Red Elemental Blast, it counters target blue spell or destroys target blue permanent. Uh, that means the spell or permanent must be blue to even be targeted. And on the Pyroblast or Hydroblast, it counters a spell if it's blue or destroys a permanent if it's blue. Um, so for the Pyro and Hydro, they can still target a thing, even if it's not the appropriate colors. Yep. I don't. I can't think of I've ever been in a game where it matters, but I guess conceivably it could because you can still fire the spell off to get your storm count up, even if you're not actually gonna successfully destroy the target. You can use it for something like Phantasmal Image, where if it becomes a target of spell or ability, it gets destroyed. Yep. Well, you could target a blue Phantasmal Image with your blue elemental blast and still destroy it, despite it not being red. So I guess technically Pyro and Hydro are slightly better. Yep. But uh, anything that has a cast trigger off an instant or sorcery. Oh, sure, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's good. Yep. If you don't have a valid target, otherwise you can still get yeah, it that um, way. A big one I can think of is, I had this happen in Standard, was with uh, Chandra Torture Defiance, her ultimate. It says whenever you cast a spell, you deal five damage to target opponent. Okay, sure. So then you, if you didn't yep. have a valid target for uh, Pyro Blast, you could yep. still target something. It just wouldn't work, but you get the you get the trigger. Yes. So, all right, that makes the sense. The spell may fizzle, but you still get the cast trigger off okay. the spell. So red and pyro we'll start with. Do you guys personally, because that's really narrow. Um, it's only a blue thing it can hit. But I think it. I think it's probably not too narrow. What do you guys think? If we're talking about the red one, no. For the red one specifically, we'll yep. start with that. Um yeah, I, I think there's enough blue stuff, and I think red's removal options are limited enough. Right there, you can deal with an, an omniscience, or you can deal with Rhystic Study, or a Mystic Remora, that or Swarm Intelligence crap. Swarm Intelligence, or a, a propaganda like that. that's keeping you from swinging in. Yep. Um, stops Rift. Like that alone that, is almost I, enough. When I was reading your notes, I was like, oh, yeah, Rift. I hate that card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think, and you can put them underneath, underneath a um, Sunforger if you are in Boros yep. and grab a Sun, grab, grab them with Sunforger, not underneath it, but you could grab them with a Sunforger. Yep. Um, I definitely think in a mono red deck, it is something to consider. I, yes. If I, you have the slot uh, slot openings for it. Now, I, don't, I don't believe you have either in your Tajik deck, do you, Max? I do not. See, uh, that's the, the downside to that is white has a lot of good removal that would right. make up for sure. that. Yes. Uh, mono, so I think I think mono red's probably the sweet spot there. Rakdos, um, it may Maybe. be in Rakdos, yeah. Because black doesn't have removal for that type of stuff. I think it might depend on the deck. If you are in a really aggro creature heavy deck, and you're like, I can't get evacuated, or I can't get rifted, or I'm I'm never going to bounce back. Um, yeah, even if it's a dead card in my hand, ninety percent of the time, yeah. at least it's there to protect me. But odds are, it's not going to be like even if you're not dealing with cyclonic rift. If you draw it, and you're like. Someone's got a, a, a consecrated sphinx, or yeah, you know, heck with that because I'm playing red and I ain't getting the card yeah. advantage like you are. One mana to hit a uh, Atraxa or Muldrotha, mm -hmm. that's worth it. So I th you're almost, I mean, there's gonna definitely be games where like you're playing against a mono green deck and a you know Selesnya deck and a 
Orzov deck and you have no targets, and yep. that's going to happen. But I mean, I feel like ninety percent of the time there's something blue in most games. It's too so, bad Painter Servant isn't right. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so how about the blue have? How about blue elemental blast and hydro blast? I think it's worthless in in commander setting. I would agree. I think you have too many. You have counter spells. Yep. I mean, even if a counter spell costs three mana, you most of them that cost the three mana can hit anything. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you don't have, like, enchantment removal that the blue could take out, but what kind of red enchantments would you really be worried about? Like a Dictate of the Twin Gods or right. an Aggravated Assault or something? And worst case, you could still boomerang that back up yep. and then counter it if you need And that's not great, but I I would agree the, the blue ones probably aren't worth a slot. I would agree with that. Like like Chris said, you just have counter spells. You would rather just play one that right. does anything you want versus a very specific type of card or color of card. Uh, and you can't even say that, like, in the case of... Maybe in a spell slinger deck, but even that I just don't. Th- I think there's just too many other things that consistently get the job done to have to worry about it in blue, whereas red's limited suite of answers sometimes makes it a whole different thing. There, I agree. So, what other um, limited cards do you want to talk about here? Any ones that jump to your mind that are worth discussing? So, uh, one that I was thinking of was like True Believer and Leyline and Sanctity, and uh, these popped into my mind due to the fact that I wanted to play True Believer in my Alesha deck which um, we've talked about before. It's a reanimator deck, so I'm playing with my graveyard a lot. And True Believer gives you as a player Hexproof or Shroud, one of the two. I'm not sure which one it is. But either way, the point of the card was to keep myself from getting Bajuka Bogged, Nihil Spellbombed, or Tormod's Crypt. So, yeah, Leyline of Sanctity and True Believer both do the same thing. They essentially give you, make you untargetable. Yep. Now, uh, the, these cards are extremely narrow in the fact are. that I don't think they go in any other deck. <laughs> So your goal there is because you have Hexproof, Bajuka Bog reads, remove all cards from target player, exile yep. all cards from target player's graveyard, and Spellbomb does, Tormund's Crypt, so you're at that point only vulnerable to exile all graveyards. Yep, like a Rest targeted. in Peace or a Leyline of the Void type of effect. Scavenger Grounds would hit it, yep. but you still get to run a lot of them because I would say aside from those three, basically, after that it's almost always targeted. Yep. Um, and and the, as the mass ones, they're easier to remove in my Alesha deck. So if I can, you know, stop the ones that just all of a sudden at any point they want to just be like, well, I'm going to get rid of it. Right. Then it works out. I hadn't really thought about the graveyard thing. That, neither had I, but that's a really good point. Now, those are enchantments, and Alesha does reanimate. Have you thought about trying Aegis of the Gods? It's the same thing, just on a body that you can reanimate. Well, True Believer is on a body. He's a 2-2. Two, two. Is it? Um, yeah, he's like hovering in the air, doing like meditation oh, with like a triangle prism yep. around yep. him that or whatever. That does say that does say creature. I can't read today, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's a two-two, so he's reanimatable. But yeah, anything like that, I've thought about. Okay, interesting. But it's hard to. Then again, we're talking about deck text now, but it's hard to slot something in. Right, like that that, that becomes challenge. It's yep. the same problem with Relevantal Blast. You have to find room for it too. Yep. What are you going to cut that's you know super powerful for such a limited slot? But if your deck really folds hard to losing that graveyard, then maybe you want to think about it. So I saw this on Chris's list, and I was I wasn't thinking in terms of graveyard. I was just wondering about targeting players. I went through the EDH rec top one hundred most frequently played cards. There was two that actually target players, Boros Charm and Rakdos Charm. Um, so I was like, ah, oh, I just don't know if it's worth it. But that graveyard thing really has me rethinking it now. If you were in like a Maldrotha deck or something where you're intentionally putting stuff in the yard even, and those decks sometimes fold really hard. Yep. I don't, that's, yep. yeah, that's Anything interesting. That you have, um, now, there is one card out there that does a similar effect, which is Shalai, Voice of Plenty. Yep. But she has such a higher upside that I think that she is... She's just good yeah. in general. Yep. Yeah, I would agree with that. So, I mean, I'm not saying all abilities like that are the same, but certain cards' ability of it is not the same. And you need to be in green-white for Shalai, yep, I believe, right? right? Yeah. Whereas True Believer, you can just run, and, and Leyline are both available yep. in any deck that can run both white. Both white. Interesting. Um, I am I'm curious if anyone has any feedback on that on Twitter, because I'm wondering if that's enough... And that graveyard thing is really having me rethink that. I'm wondering if you're in a super graveyard deck, if that would matter to you. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'd like to get some feedback because that's really making me think <laughs> that, about that it. That was the, the whole reason I thought of that card was because of it was something on my list of a card that yeah. I was going to play. All right. Um, fog effects is one that you had also mentioned here, Chris. Yep. Um, and at first I was like, no, fogs are good. But then I was like, well... There's I one don't good run. Fog. There's one, right. I was like, well, Constant Miss. Miss is really, really good, but I don't know um, if I'm going to run Fog. Now, if you're in a reanimator deck, then you could do Spore Frog too. 
Right, yeah. I mean, those two, because they're um, repeatable sources or whatever. Yes, but right. Plain old, plain old fog. Yeah, unless... And again, maybe in a turbo fog deck where you need a bunch of fo- fog effects for whatever thing you're killing time for, whether it's Maze's End or because you're playing Angus Super Friends and you're trying to get to oh, alt, your walkers, some yeah, alts or something. Because Angus does it Right, himself, right, so. maybe. Yep. Um, so my thought on this after thinking about it a little bit, and, my, and a constant miss was the exception, because <laughs> that card is insane. <laughs> Uh, that there's plenty of times in constant mist where like I've scooped to constant mist because I'm like I don't have any counter magic and you're at 16 lands and I'm just never going to win this race so yep. let's just scoop it up and every turn they keep playing another land right. and you're just like or, or, or I've had people well, scoop to me people have scooped to me before yep. when I've played it before in decks where they're like well this, I'm just never going to get through this yep uh, but aside from that I don't know I, I think fog effects that aren't always fog effects is what jumps out at me I use Sudden Spoiling for a Fog pretty frequently, and I use um, Polymorphous Jest. to b- Both of those, uh, Sudden Spoiling makes creatures into zero twos, and Polymorphous Jest makes them one one, so I guess it isn't a true Fog. But I kind of use those as Fogs. And it's I use, basically the, a similar concept. But you can also use it for other things. Yep. Uh, Teferi's Protection I've used as a Fog. I usually oftentimes use that when I'm going to cast it, it's when someone is swinging at me for something, and I'm like, okay, well, I was going to do it anyway, so I might as well do it mid-swing and save myself 20 damage. Right. Uh, so I think that's the fogs I use, but like just plain old fog, I just I think it's probably too narrow. Yeah. I think anything that reads... No, my basis for fog was anything that read uh, prevents combat damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Selfless Squire, which is a, a three and a white for a creature with flash when yep. it... ETBs prevent all damage that you would take this turn, and then it gets that many plus one plus one counters on it. Which is you're right. Uh, Joey Schultz on Idiot Track Cast is a big fan of that one yeah. too. But again, it's recurrable and it does other things and might stack with the deck you're doing. So I think, yeah, I, I don't think for most most decks, decks it's just a one time fog effect as like a real fog probably isn't enough. No, yep. unless you have a way to continuously recur them. Um, I don't see it because I've thought about um, well, this kind of. Um, it ties into Leyland and Sanctity. A uh, Dawn Charm is a really good card. Yep. Um, because there, there's two modes on Dawn Charm that really matter. One of them gives you hex proof, I believe, and one of them is a fog, right? Um, I don't remember what all of them are. Dawn Charm says choose one, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt this turn, regenerate target creature, or counter target spell that targets you. So I guess it counters it, but it effectively kind of yep. heck gives you hex proof, I guess, for all intents and purposes. Um, so I thought about Dawn Charm in my Sphinx deck. I'm like, okay, but I don't know. I could just run a counter spell and stop the spell in the first place, or I could just run like an, another like Aether Eyes or Aether Spells variation instead of the Fog and bounce every creature to their hand and or, or Evacuation or something, which would be way more devastating than just skip you know them skipping combat yep. damage for one turn. So I think there's at this point in our particular format, there's enough things. Whether it's like spider spawning in surprise spiders, surprise, yes, like you activated so my trap strong. Card. Right, <laughs> I think there's enough of those things that make fog not quite good enough. Yes, Max, you have any of these you want to talk about? I want to talk about a card I actually used to run. Okay, and that would be compost. Oh yeah. So this is an enchantment for one in a green, and it says whenever a black card is put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, you draw a card. So this was in a, one of the original versions of my Dromoka deck, and it did some work for a while, but over time it just became a dead card because our meta shifted. There wasn't a lot of black decks hanging out in the shop. Um, I think it is narrow because it's very specific to, like, it has to be a black card. And you're not actually casting black cards yourself. Right. And It's only for opponents. And oh, it's opponents. only for opponents. Okay. And, like, the commanders don't count. Like, if you get rid of a a Kalidus or something, well, that's just going to get replaced to the command zone, so you don't get the draw for that. Yep. So, I mean, you have to have a lot of ways to get stuff into the graveyard, and in mono green, there's not a lot of ways to kill stuff easily, except maybe fight mechanic. Yeah, which I found, you know, really weird, because they have a whole cycle of stuff like that, where it's like, green is taken on black, and... Um, green's taken on blue and stuff like that, but or red's taken on like white. Right. Yeah, I, I don't understand that cycle at all. So, on that same subject, then, um, 
How are there any of those things that care about an enemy color? We mentioned the elemental blast, but there's quite a few enchantments I think that care about colors, kind of like that. Are there any of those that you've ever used or you think are quite good enough? Circle of protection blank. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I've <laughs> seen circle of protections ran before in decks, but they've never struck you me you as don't good run enough. The circles you run the other ones that you can cycle. Cycle if you need yes. to. <laughs> Man, even then, I've I don't know you, if you I've do because I've seen circles too, and I'm like. No, there's a better one, and I'll show or, them, and they're like, oh. <laughs> or I think there's a story circle where you can pick the color when it comes into play, but it costs, okay. I think, two white and a colorless. Um, you actually have a card kind of like that in your Scarty deck called, F- I think it's Flickering Lights. Flickering Ward. Flickering Ward. A target creature gains protection from a color. Um, it's one mana for an aura. That, however, you can is bounce, useful. You can bounce back to your hand and choose <laughs> the, a new right. color next time. But the time. key for that is you can spend a white mana. Yep. And there's been enough times where I'm like, oh, Sarah Sanctum taps, taps, taps for 11. I'm going to cast it and bounce it and cast it and bounce it and cast it and bounce it and, <laughs> and, and draw a card off an enchantment. Just don't ever time. choose white because all your auras fall Right, off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's a good card. Um, yep. But the bounce is what really puts it over yes. the top there. Th- th- there's a couple of these I looked at after s- talking about compost. Uh, there's Insight, which is two and a blue. Uh, whenever one of your opponents casts a green spell, draw a card. And I was like, I, I again, I think there's too many things to probably run that. But maybe if you're in a really small meta where you're playing with like six people and they all play green decks, I then I would say you would run it. But I think outside of that, I don't know if that one's good enough. There's a few um, ones that destroy all like white creature, destroy all black creatures. But I've never seen those cast, and I, I feel like that's too narrow, too. Um, I used to run Mass Calcify. That would be Destroys one of them. all non white creatures. All non white creatures. And I, because I think I ran that in my Audric 2.0 deck because it's a mono white deck, sure. and it makes sense, but it is still pretty narrow. When, and it was seven, it's seven men, I think. Yes, five and two white. Um, and something to keep in mind here, listeners, is cards like that say destroy a certain color means the color and the casting cost, not right. any colors and its activated ability. So, you know, Shu, well, Alesha Shu is a Yun. Red card. Yeah, Alesha is a red card. Yep. So, like, Shu Yun is a blue card, but it has a, a hybrid Boros activated to cost. So that doesn't make it a red or a white card. You also, at least in my mind, because I have, I ran Mass, Mass Calcify in a mono white deck for a while too, thinking, of course, well, I play white. This is all white, so it's never going to hit me. And, you know, four of the five other colors will have to get destroyed, which is kind of true, except for you forget that, well, yeah, that person's deck isn't mono-white, but it's white-green, and half their creatures are still white, if not more sometimes. Yeah, if yeah, they could have all their creatures be white, and right. green's the support color with enchantments and other stuff, card draw. I mean, I, similarly, I have all this dust in my uh, Vela deck that has so many colorless creatures in it and there's absolutely times it's a bomb but there's been enough times I've cast it like well all four of my creatures are fine and then I look around and I'm like yeah but that guy's got a worm coil engine and that person over there has a hanger back walker and something else and that stuff is all going to skate away Mass Calify kind of did the same thing Yep. You th- yeah your creatures all live but so does that Gave Guru with Spores and so does that um, you know Sidisi or excuse me uh, Cedri Avanic Genius, and yep. so does that, whatever. Like, a lot of creatures skate underneath that because they're multicolor, and white is, it's not a non-white creature then at that point. Yep. How about ones that care about the specific land? Because you, uh, you started mentioning my cigar deck, I thought you were going to say this card, which is Carpet of Flowers. And there's a few different variants on this, but I, I, I think Carpet of Flowers is the first one to go to because I think it's probably... The best of these narrow cards. And it's the most well-known, probably, yeah. for the land and it's up ones. to, like, $8 or something stupid now. Yes, Carpet of Flowers I can get behind, because when it works, it nets you advantage. It's one green, so the opportunity cost is really, really low. Yep. And, man, I mean, occasionally, sure, I've been looking, I'm like, oh, that guy only has two islands out. Still, one green to get two mana every turn isn't yep. terrible. Now, if we compare this to Choke. Right. Where that you destroy is, all islands. No, Choka, uh, all islands do not untap. Oh, they don't untap, okay. Yep. That card would be narrow compared to Carpet of Flowers because if you're not playing against a blue deck, it does absolutely nothing. Right, yes. Whereas Carpet of Flowers, e- even if there's no blue in play, okay, it's going to probably make my Nykthos tap for one more. It's yep. going to make Ancestral Mask on Sagarda that much bigger because it's an Enchantress deck. And when it works, it, it can be disgusting. You can get eight mana turn off it. I mean, it sees CDEH play. It's good enough for that. Right. Now, if we compare that to Blood Moon, 
that's going to hit pretty much any deck. Right. Yes. Yeah. There were a couple more that I that in, in thinking about this that I've seen. Um, Karma, I've seen in a couple different decks, which is two white white. Um, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, Karma deals damage to that player equal to the number of swamps they control. But I feel like that probably is something that people run with Urborg or to or in metas with a lot of Urborgs. But I've seen Karma cut down a couple times. And been like, okay, I'm fine. And then the, an Urborg comes out. I'm like, ooh, I'm going to take 14 damage. <laughs> <laughs> ooh. So I think Karma is probably not too narrow, um, but I think it requires a little more. I don't think you're just running Karma and hoping people have swamps. I think yep. you're probably doing something with it. And there's there's Roots of Life, which is one um, and two green, so three total. Whenever you cast Roots of Life, choose islands or swamps. And whenever one of those lands becomes tapped, that an opponent controls, you gain one life. See, that one, yes, it's narrow, but it has an upside to it because you get to choose, choose between one of two. the two, and it also plays with Erdborg. If you're playing yep. like in a black green deck, maybe you're like, ah, oh, well, I'm also running Erdborg. Maybe I'll play it because if I happen to have Erdborg out and this, I could easily be gaining 25, 30 life a turn right. when everyone's just doing their thing. Yeah. And and if they choose to then not tap, well, that's great too because you're taxing them. By not wanting to play stuff. Yeah. And it, although no one's, they're still going to tap, but you're just going to gain free life. Basically, just like I'm gonna get free treasures exactly. after I get my smothering ties. Exactly. <laughs> um, there's a few that destroy all lands. You you mentioned um, choke, but I guess there's things like this. Is boil destroy all islands? Destroy boil all destroys islands. all islands. Flash fires destroys all forests. Uh, planes. planes. Um, and I think tsunami destroys all islands. Tsunami or destroys like that. All, and I think acid rain is the blue one that destroys all forests. That was in the legends. Okay. So there's a few of those older cards that destroy all land type. I don't think I've ever seen any of them ran. I think they're pro- again probably too narrow. No, and then that's like because a lot of the CMCs on those is higher. So let's compare it to Ruination, which destroys all non-basic sure, lands, right. or even an Armageddon or something like that. Yeah. that just destroys everything. Yeah, I don't think there's a many situations where you, where you just want to take out islands. You see how scumbag Armageddon, player with Armageddon. He's, he's converting. <laughs> I went to the cheap one. <laughs> now that uh, I have started infinite comboing in a deck, Max has taken it up a level. I, I've been infinite <laughs> comboing way longer than you have. That's what I'm saying. Now that I'm doing it too, you got to kick it up a notch and start blowing up lands. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> go that low on the scumbag. Just so, wait, well, everyone who's going to play with me, there will be Armageddon with Boros Charm in my. Uh, Hammer deck. I can't even think of the name of that stupid hammer. Sunforger. Now. Sunforger. Well, this is a card you're talking about blowing up lands. It's a card I saw two weeks ago, and then I saw it in a different deck last week, which is Sacred Ground, which is a colorless and white. Whenever a spell or an ability an opponent controls causes a land to be put in your graveyard, return that land to play. Mm. Which I, I knew existed, but it never occurred to me before to run it in a commander deck because, again, it felt too narrow. Because it doesn't save your stuff from yourself. So it's if you are sacrificing strip mine, it doesn't save it. It's only yep. when someone else blows up your things. And one of the decks it was in was the um, Awaken Commander, the red, oh. blue. Um, Jory, no, not Jory. Jor- yeah. Uh, it Jory N? Was it Jory N? Oh, I, maybe it was a Jory N deck. No, it was, it's a white, blue. Oh, oh you're the Noyan Dar. Noyan Dar. Noyan Dar. Noyan Dar. Yeah. Um, so it was a Noyan Dar deck, which makes sense because you're animating your lands with Awaken and yeah. there's a bunch of Awaken effects that got it there. But I saw it in a different deck. Someone else played it in, I think, an Enchantress deck. And I don't know if, um, I, I didn't ask about it, but I'm wondering if they're like, well, Sarah's Sanctum is so valuable in this deck and maybe Nykthos is that I want to keep him from keep losing them. Keep him coming them. back. Yeah. Um, so again, kind of like your graveyard thing, I was I had always thought it was too narrow outside of maybe Noyan Dar. But then I was like, huh, I wonder if that's... Maybe not too narrow. What do you guys think of that one? I think you have to be playing in a meta where yeah. there's a lot of land destruction, whether it's through mass land destruction or just you see a lot of single targeted land removal. I mean, Field of Ruins, Ghost Quarters, Strip Mines. If everyone is running four of those in their deck. That's probably a lot a the, bigger deal than if people have one or two. Yeah, I think if you're running, if you're in a meta where everybody's running three or more in every one of their decks, a two mana enchantment that always makes sure you get your best land back the minute it gets killed is yeah. a great idea. Yeah, especially if your deck needs that land to function. Like, let's say you're going, we'll do Urborg into Cabal Coffers into Torment to Hailfire. Right. So you need the Cabal Coffers, so if they destroy it, you just Yeah, if that's your only win condition, yep. maybe yep. you do need that. I, I do like thinking about this with, like, the flip enchantments from Ixalan because they're going to come back 
as the enchantment, which a lot of those have, like, enter the battlefield triggers. Oh, sure. So you can, like, redo your growing rights. You can... Search won't trigger right away, but some of them do have ETB triggers, which will just be like, okay, cool, thank you. And I, just, I never I thought just, about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I don't think that's enough to run it. But Neither I, do I. But, but it's I, a good. But I think in that Noy, in that Noyandar deck, where maybe you, where it does make sense, then maybe you want to lean into a few more of those things anyway. Yeah. Because um, I well, that's a, a good example of that I, I was just tweaking my um, uh, Planeswalker deck, um, Jiru, with eyes open this week because I was like, oh, I don't you know Did have you money. Do? Did you do? I don't have many proliferate effects in here. I'm like, I should. I, I have so many planeswalkers. Why don't I put in contagion class, contagion engine, throw in a gas just to try a few of these things yep. out? And then I'm like, well, okay, well, if I'm doing this, I want to throw in ever flowing chalice instead of marble diamond because you know, it's a two mana rock and a two mana rock. Why not? Just in case I happen to have it out, there's like no, not much downside to it. So I, I t- yeah, and the amount of times that Jerry's going to die, and you're going to want to be able to cast them. So if you draw the ever flowing chalice late, it's gonna- right? I can put more counters yep. on it. There's no real downside to it. So I did. So I think it's kind of the same thing here. Maybe if you are already running a Noyandar deck where you put in Sacred Ground, then maybe that makes sense. Like you said, Max, run a few of those flip cards just in case you, you get a chance to bounce them back. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, I'm going to go back to you saying you're flipping, you're going to put in Everflowing Chalice into that deck. Wouldn't, if you're going the Proliferate route, wouldn't Astral Cornucopia be better? Because then if you need the colored mana, you can at least take white. I could, but... I mean, it's one extra... It's two extra mana, essentially. I thought about that, but my thought process is because it's a mono-white deck, I don't need as many different sources. I can right. get away with colorless much more frequently okay. because for the most part... Right. I can I can meet the requirements because so many of my lands are planes. I have, I think, 29 planes in the deck. Mm-hmm. So most of my sources make white. I, but I, thought, you, I thought about that. And though. you run the doublers and whatnot, so... The other one I considered was... Um, Cage Slot. A Coalition Relic. Because it does get a counter on it as well, and it's a good card in general. And I'm like, maybe I'll try that in the deck. Again, there's not much downside, and if I happen to proliferate, there'll be one turn or every other turn where I can get a few extra counters yep. on it. So, anyway, that's kind of an aside here. Are there any more specific narrow cards you guys want to talk about before we talk about strategies? I'm good. So, in addition to to narrow cards, we 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 were the the kind of higher level thing is strategies that are maybe narrow and the first one chris mentioned was dredge um which is fantastic in other formats oh it's stupid in other formats is it too narrow for commander do you think i don't think it's too narrow per se but it definitely can get shut down very fast yeah i that was kind of my thought too because gitrog monster kind of tends to be a dredge deck and i've seen titania ones that are dredge decks for the most part too yeah now when i was thinking dredge i was thinking like um Sidisi Brood Tyrant type of deck, where okay. all all the effects in your deck are throwing cards into your graveyard. Everything that builds around yep. putting things in the yard. Yep, which is what Dredge is supposed sure. to be doing. Tassiger, I think, kind of does that as yep. well. Now you could just get shut down immediately when someone plays Rest in Peace. Sure, see that ya. kind of stuff. But you kind of can in other form. I mean, that's the reason Rest in Peace is a card in sideboards and other formats too. But for some reason, I feel like even though there's no sideboard, the fact that there's three other players. And they tend to run those cards in their decks anyway. Like there tends to be graveyard hate. Yep. As we not enough because they always tell you to run more. <laughs> but like I feel like if you're really reliant on that graveyard, like dredge strategies, super are, you're at some point you're gonna get burned. Yep. Yeah. But I think it's viable. I think dredge is something you can actually play. I think it is play. very viable as well. And it, I think it comes down to the fact that people need to look for cards that say when this enters the bat the graveyard or if something happened bring this back from the graveyard like narc amoeba that doesn't say dredge but it is a right. dredge card mm-hmm. uh, because there's only technically 13 cards that say the word dredge yes. on them so like you can't build an edh deck with those just, 13 cards. just out of dredge you need your prized amalgams your conflagrates your right. narc amoeba stuff like that but there's been enough of those cards printed over the years that actually do pretty good work in dredge decks exactly what other archetypes do you guys think are, are worth looking at here about maybe being too narrow well we talked about this one last week in our ravnica allegiance show but let's talk about mill okay yeah that's a good one well we all kind of mentioned too um what happened i so i started this show talking about my veil of the nightclad deck yep. running a game because mill happened to me and, right. and i had um that mere battlesphere put in my graveyard by somebody else that's the risk with mill you can enable some decks and that isn't even a graveyard deck 
I, I, I have a junk diver in there because... It's a good artifact. It's a good artifact. And it, part of the reason is because that CMC in my deck was getting too high. And I'm like, I need some artifact creatures in this deck that cost three or less. Well, that's so, a lot of people have come up to me asking me about decks. And um, as they're building them, they're like, what would you suggest? I'm like, well, if you have a Titan or a Nexus of Fate, like if you're in blue, I'm like, slot it in. Sure. And they, yeah. they always ask me why. I'm like, because Mill is a deck that roams around every now and then. And you just turn it off. Yeah. Right, you basically negate all the work they've done. Yep. Yeah, I, that's that's the real risk with Mill is you enable somebody else or they just turn it off. Yep. Um, but it can work. I've seen it work. I, I've seen it work, and I think the, the addition of persistent uh, petitioners is going to be a huge yes. help for the people attempting to build a Mill deck in a multiplayer format. I feel like right now, Phoenix is really your best option. And Phoenix, is, I think, is close to good enough. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have a Phoenix mill deck in the shop. Yeah. You d- you need the backup plans. You need to have ley lines, and you need to have Grave Hate to protect yourself so you're not making those reanimator decks, which we'll probably touch on reanimator here in a minute. <laughs> so you're not making the reanimator decks, just doing the work for them. You need to have Grave I Hate. I love it when I run into mill. I'm I just do. like, thank you. <laughs> well, they're, they're, I mean, I think we've all been in those games where somebody's trying to do mill stuff, and they, and they look around and go, well, I can't mill you, and I can't mill you, so I'm going to hit you, the third person. Like, yep. that doesn't feel good when you know you you shouldn't mill two of the three decks at the table and that happens pretty frequently right but i think phoenix kind of gets it done and i think persistent petitioners will probably do it as well i think it'll definitely do it i was actually contemplating building a mill deck because i picked up an aminatu the other day and running it as an esper deck so i get access to rest in peace and you have all the hate in those colors just so then i can lock out their graveyard so everything's exiled so they don't get any of the uh, entering graveyard effects or anything like that because it immediately goes to exile. Yeah, that was the first thing when I saw Petitioner. So I was thinking was a Loro because you have Rust in Peace, you have Leyline, you have, is it Nether Void? Yep. Um, that's the one mana Leyline of, of the Void. Um, so you have a couple of different things you can do to hate on graveyards there in those colors and lets you still do your own thing. So yeah, I agree that Esper's a good way to do that. And you get Mind Grind, the best you do. <laughs> mill spell in the game. And you get Consuming Aberration, which... Oh, gets so disgusting when somebody is getting milled. Unless you have a rest in peace. Unless out. you have a rest in peace out, right? But see so, you now, if you play one v one commander with me, you get the wonderful option of uh, grindstone and painter servant. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, you, can, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you just go. I win. <laughs> and I guess I mean Una Queen of the Fae has some pretty good mill combos, but that's more of a combo thing. You're for the most part with Una, you're trying to get the infinite combo going. You're not usually milling people for value See, there. But that's an upside with Una that I think if you're going to do mill, you actually have a backup plan. Sure, that's true, yeah. Because you can start making these fairies and just go ham with Una then. And then, right, or vice versa. You can have that be, have the mill be your backup plan too. You yep. can be making fairies and that doesn't work, so I need to mill combo you out. Yep. Especially if you get greedy playing a cigar to deck and draw like 40 cards. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we talked about reanimator here. Uh I think reanimator works. I don't think this is a narrow strategy in EDH. I would say it's not. I, I think in some other formats it is because I don't think reanimator gets a lot of support in standard these days. Definitely not in or standard. If, or if there is, I mean, Mold, there's Moldrotha, mm-hmm. but a lot of it either is an extremely high costing card or the effect to get the reanimator ability is extremely uh, niche. Like you have to do a lot of things to get that effect. It's it definitely a real strategy in older formats. But it's not a player Especially in standard. Legacy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which I'm big into now. That's your new thing. Surprisingly, Legacy is not much more expensive than Modern, I found out. Which isn't so much the Legacy's <laughs> gotten cheaper. It's that Modern's really expensive. Uh, That's financed by Chris, everybody. No, I agree Reanimator isn't quite as narrow. Um, I still think it's a narrow strategy, especially if you're banking on just being Reanimator. Like, your goal is to reanimate things out of other people's okay, graveyards, sure. your graveyard, that kind of stuff. I, I think there's... Because Chainer is a popular deck. You have, obviously, Maldrotha, Marin, yep. Caridor. I've seen Chainer decks get just turned off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I have, too. Um, I that's, That is a good way to look at it. I think there's a lot of decks that are reanimated decks, but they're probably narrow in the sense that they are easy to shut off. There's It's, it's kind of tough to shut down Max's... Um, Dromoka deck, for example. I mean, there's ways you can do it. If you're if you're stacking four or five different propaganda effects, you can probably do a pretty good job of it. Uh, but that's, don't do that. <laughs> don't yeah, don't do that. Do but it. but that, that doesn't happen very frequently. Whereas uh, with graveyard hate, you can just shut on reanimator decks, and that yep. does happen pretty frequently. Yep, and that's a big thing. 
Um, I tell everyone who ever asks me about building a deck is you need to always have a backup plan in your deck. And that shouldn't be just a second version of the first plan. Yes. <laughs> you, you need at least two backup plans. And that's not a bad idea either. It's good to have redundant effects and redundant yep. plans, but be able to go multiple different directions to win games. I, I agree with that. Burn. We'll go back to mm. things that are good in other formats. Is burn too narrow in Commander? I think it is. Mostly, I've seen. I guess it depends how you define burn. I'm right. De- I want to defy burn. I actually wrote this down as uh, burn was created as a archetype of a deck that kills fast. Yes, it cares little about the board. All it cares about is your life total. Now in commander, I want to say at least fifty percent of decks that I play against have some sort of life gain in them. Yes. Yeah. Um, another thing is a lot of the burn spells are cheap CMC, but do don't do much. Three damage to the face is way less effective in a forty life format with three opponents than it is. That's one hundred twenty life, life format. You gotta try and get through. Yeah, yeah, that's now, not a good percentage. No. Now, if we talk about like let's say Mizzix or something, that was the first time I thought of I'm like, does Mizzix count as burn? Because a lot of times Mizzix runs big <laughs> X spells. Yep. Yep. Um, that's a different story because you're playing the big X spells, right. which I don't really consider burn because you're doing so much other stuff that. Yeah, I don't know if I. I that was a que- that was I was trying to figure out. Do I consider Mizzix or like Melek? Because Melek copies spells oftentimes. Is that burn? I don't think it is. I, I mean, with Mizzix, I I agree. Like, it's not really a burn deck because you take so long to build up your experience counters and your land base, and to keep Mizzix even on the field because it's a kind of a heavily targeted commander or was. I haven't seen one of those decks in a while, now that I think about it. Um, like, you need to get to that turn 9 or 10 to be able to even say, like, okay, cool, I have, you know, 8 experience counters, and this Comet Storm costs 2 red. Okay, cool. I can do 10, maybe, if I'm lucky. Now, I think Burn is a support archetype in EDH. Okay. Like, um, if, let's say you're playing Mono Red... Um, we'll just go with my 1v1 deck of Zergo. Um, burn is a backup to what you're doing. You have all these creatures that are beating in, so let's say you get someone down where they have 10 life left. Your couple of burn spells can take that out in a heartbeat. Yep. Sure. Because you've already on the game plan of you know extreme aggro, but you also need something to just punch through just a little bit more. Yeah. I think in, in multiplayer, you want the, the burn spells that do something else. So Boros Charm. Yep. You can hit someone for four... Give something double strike, make all your stuff indestructible. Uh, risk factor. Ex- risk you, factor yeah. is a you, good example. You, you take four or let me draw three, and then I'm going to do it again. Yep. Um, I think that in a multiplayer setting, you want the you want the double type effects on these burn spells. I would agree with that. Yeah. Like um, fall fall of the titans. Fall of the titans. Fall of the titans. Two people. Good. Yeah. I mean, Jai is emulating uh, fire. You know, yeah, you need a legendary creature out or a planeswalker, but I mean. Three red and X to deal that much to three separate targets. That's your three players in your game. But then you start getting into effects like, okay, so where does that end? Is Chandra's Ignition probably not a burn? Sp- I mean, I kill people with Chandra's Ignition yeah, that, all the that's time. That's a win con. Yeah. I really want that card to be good in one v one, but I can't do you it. You can't quite make it. Because <laughs> I got to my Mina and Den deck this week. I had Rampaging Brontodon, which is the starter deck card, the which is like seven mana. But it's a 7-7 seven, seven with Trample, and when it attacks, it gets plus one, plus one for each land you control. So it went up to like a 22-22 on attack, and then I Chandra's, got the Chandra's Ignition <laughs> up in. <laughs> Lovely. But yeah, it, I mean, so, yeah, it's, I guess, burn in this modern sense where you're looking at mostly like three mana bolts and stuff. I just don't think it plays. No, and I mean, you don't have cards that are legal like channel and stuff like that where you can just go fast early right. and kill someone. And, I mean, we're kind of overlooking the obvious. We're in a singleton format. Yep. There's right, a difference yeah. between having four lightning bolts for 12 damage versus one lightning bolt for three. Exactly. Right? I math, right? Three, six, nine, twelve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you factor in the... the and it's not just... It, it's And it's, it's 60 cards. Right. 60 cards and it's four lightning bolts. But it's also four lightning strikes and, you know, maybe four chain lightnings in some formats and four lava spikes. Is that one of the ones that gets mm-hmm. ran? Yep. Whereas, in, and that gets cumulative, so now you're talking 24 cards in your 60-card deck versus, okay, if you run one of each, that's four cards in your 100-card deck. 4%. Yeah, I mean, that's just, it's not going to get you there. No. Not without, without running Lava Axes and, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Do it. 
I mean, if you can make it happen, good. For, if you can make that happen, good Ristic for you. Lightning, I believe, if they don't yeah. pay the yeah. two, it deals them two damage or something like that. Now, I, I wonder if you guys would consider my Mogus deck a burn deck. Uh, I, that's like group slug, where everyone's yeah. t- it's the opposite I, of group hug. <laughs> yeah, I, I call that a punisher deck. Yeah, because it does similar effects because it's only dealing X amount of damage and it's pretty much all direct damage, but it does it to everybody. And I think if you're burn deck, that's the way to go with burn. Your burn deck is dealing earthquake kind of damage to everybody. So you have Ashley and the Pilgrim who you move the counters that deals damage to all players and creatures, kind of the same thing. That would make sense in that kind of a deck. It's I think you can probably yeah. get it done there. Yeah, I think if you're if to make burn viable, it has to be. All players. Multi-targets. Yeah. Yep. You can't get away with just single target because, yeah, you could, you know, hunt someone down and kill them outright. Then you got two other players and you just burned everything you had and you're sitting there in the corner crying and weeping. So th- the last one Chris put on his list here, and at first I was like, it's I, I wrote very legit, which is commander damage. <laughs> commander, <laughs> commander kill only. I'm like, that absolutely happens. But then I got thinking in terms of, okay, but you also said... You're talking narrow strategies. What if that's your only strategy? If like your plan is my commander is my my win condition, and I have no other ways. None of my other creatures can really get it done consistently. My only way to win this game is to hit somebody in the face with, I don't even Thraxamundar. Yeah, I was gonna say Maelstrom Wanderer because that's kind of similar because a lot of times they're not they're. It's a turns deck. Mm, I can't think of the name of what happens. Cascade. 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 There we go. Yeah, when they cascade, they're cascading for stuff that's less than Maelstrom Wanderer, right. and it's usually just, like Max said, infinite turns or other stuff like that. I think there, though, you have enough enablers that... I don't know if I... It's a, I guess you're dealing with commander damage a lot of times, but it's not... It's being done in a way that's much easier to do than you're like, oh, I just need to Voltron up this uh, Rafik and swing through, and if... I don't have Rafik to put stuff on. I can't. I have no way to kill anybody. I, I think Rafik is the perfect yeah. example of that. Um, I think it's way more narrow. If that's your plan, if your commander is your kill condition, and that's really your only con- kill condition, I think the way the game functions today, after people have been playing commander now for you know 10 years pretty consistently, and we've had a bunch of pre-cons, and we have people on podcasts talking about it, <laughs> And you have EDH rec, and I think everyone's everyone's a better commander player than they were five years ago on average. Right. And I don't know I, if that's – I think it's too narrow. I, I agree, and I think uh, when if you want to build this type of strategy, I'm going to reference something uh, Luke Witten used to say on uh, our old show. you got to bring in the three-hit rule. Like, you want to find a commander – got to three-turn clock. you got to find a commander that can do it in three turns. So that means Thraxamunder is a great example. It's, what, a 7-7 seven, seven out of the gate – and he gets counters on him pretty frequently when he swings. So oftentimes he's a ter- right. two-turn yeah. clock. But it's also those higher-powered commanders cost a lot of mana. Yeah. So you're right. not doing this on turn two or three. You're doing it on turn seven if you're lucky, or maybe a little earlier because of mana rocks. I think you need to. I think commander damage is a legit way to kill people, and you can have that as a backup plan. But I think if it's your only plan, and and your deck can't function without that, I don't think that's viable these days. Um, I know when I had my Ural deck, I specifically took one week off when I was playing it to choose not to ever cast the general and just okay. start suiting up all the weenies and the yep. dummies in the deck to see if I could still win. And I could still win doing that. So I'm like, okay, so this deck does not rely around If Ural's, go- if Ural's gone, you can find ways to, yep. to, 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 sneak, to sneak through with an enchantress or with Heliod, probably in the deck because he's an enchantment and draws you a card. And like, okay, well, I can suit up Heliod and get through yep. on occasion or I can suit up somebody else. Um, and I've seen that enough times in like Voltron decks that are using a bunch of equipment. Sometimes like, okay, well, if I have um, Pure Steel Paladin out, right. I can put everything on Pure Steel Paladin for free or on somebody else and maybe get through. You should at least have that as a backup plan. But yeah, I think that one's gotten too narrow. Any other strategies you guys think are, are don't quite get the job done anymore? I have one more. What's yours? Control. Oh, uh, Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, okay, I'll be curious why why control popped into your head. Um, we kind of been playing against a lot of it in other formats, <laughs> and it was it was nice to sit down and play at EDH on Tuesday and not be facing against control. So you grabbed my Talran deck on Tuesday. Yep. And then one of the players you were playing against across the table was like, "How does this Talran deck win?" <laughs> <laughs> Just is, watch. Is, that, is that why he was asking? Did he yeah, think it was okay? He was like, 
he had, he like plays something you can counter that. I'm like, no, I don't have a counter spell. He plays something how you can counter that. I'm like, no, I don't have a counter. Then he asks okay, you, how okay. does this <laughs> deck win? <laughs> yes, that is not a control deck. There's a no. few counter spells in it, but it is not a control deck. Right. Um, well, that's a good point though. Like, because if that deck was a control deck, I don't know if it would win. It would control games and make them go slower. But part of the reason that deck wins is I start doing that portent into ponder into preordain into something else and there's eight drakes in the table and then i play gravitational shift and blow somebody up um whereas if i wasn't doing things like that i'm like okay you got to play a counter spell i need to play a counter spell to make a drake then people start slowing their roll down because they don't want to get countered and they're trying to and they'll start baiting cards out and... yeah it, it, i think th- it would be much tougher to win games with that deck i think if it was a real control deck now, I do believe pseudo control is a viable set. Uh, I would agree with that too. A good example, I would have to say, probably the closest deck I've seen is your Sphinx deck. Mm-hmm. You have uh, X amount of counters in there, but you have these big beaters that are really nasty and do other stuff. Yes. So you're just you're protecting yourself with them, and then anything that you don't like, like a board wipe or something, you're like, oh no 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 no, you don't get to cast that. That's where I think the sweet spot is in Commander is that that control shell to keep bad things from happening while you still have plans to win the game versus yep. versus 1v1 or brawl when brawl was an issue um there you can do it like in in, in a 1v1 format control is 100 percent a legit archetype because you can keep that one player in check and because it's a 20 life format you can chip them down through time through time by via yep. control brawl is not good in multiplayer commander number one you're just everyone's gonna key your car after the game is over, <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're never you're never going to chip down three people at forty life with incidental yeah, damage. The, the biggest issue I've seen with control, and I've seen a lot of people try playing it, mm-hmm. is you're playing against three other people. Three people. That's twice. You, that's three times as many spells. You burn so much yeah, of your resources, you and you're tapped out. And then after going through like two people, and the third player is like, "Cool, I'm just going to jam this." Right, and yeah. you're like, "Oh, that's the one I really need to right, stop." Right. Exactly. Yep. No, that's a that's a good call. I think if you want to play control in a multiplayer format, you have to be really good at the politics game because you need to rely on your opponents to also help you control the yeah. game. So you can save that counter spell for that big bad thing that you should have saved it for to begin with. Now, the closest deck that I've seen that's good control would be um, our shop owner, Phil. He plays uh, Joda, whatever, Joda whatever. I don't know what temporal the Temporal Arch- Archmage? Yeah, some, nope, that's Teferi. That's Teferi, Temporal Arch- Archmage. But Joda, Joda the- Eternal. Archmage Eternal. I don't know. He's three colors Archmage and then has Eternal. a five color yeah. ability. Um, but he's playing all planeswalkers. Yes. And all these planeswalkers, they're not like the dirty, like, I'm going to draw a card, I'm going to do this. No, it's like, oh, I'm going to jam Nicol Bolas and I'm going to blow that up. Right. Or I'm going to steal that from you. Or I'm going to play Chandra and wipe the field. And then all he's playing is removal spells with it. So he, so that's a that's kind of a control shell, yep. but he has a plan to win the game. Yep, because all the planeswalkers pose a threat. Sure. So instead of them attacking you... They're attacking your planeswalkers. You're just like, ha, 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 ha. And you're like, board wipe, play another planeswalker. What are you going to do about this one? I think you also see those decks that are built in with other things like like taxes. Grand Arbiter is oftentimes what is a control deck, but it's it's relying on taxing the whole table versus yep. just counterspelling people. Or a lot of times like a, a Stax deck will do kind of the same thing. A lot of times Stax decks are paired with blue, so you can deal with you can counter things that are a problem and you're stacking everybody down. So I think then it becomes much more of a thing if you're pairing your control with something else. But yeah, I think pure control really is going to struggle to win games in Commander. Yes. Yeah. That was a good. That was a good one. Well, if you want to reach out to us and talk about any narrow cards that you actually think are good enough to play in Commander, let us know. Or any strategies you think are not good enough, or ones that maybe we talked about that are good enough that you want to share an alternate opinion. Dinosaurs can, not good enough. Not good enough. Oh, that deck oh. wrecked my face last week. <laughs> it's a sore spot for Max. Uh, that's well, why I don't like Jurassic Park. <laughs> De-evolved dragons. <laughs> All right. I think that is going to be it for this week. We're going to be back next week with a different show, and we will have a few uh, bonus shows coming out on Thursday for the next few weeks to doing some deck techs. Right. All right. Tell that I'm Dana. I'm Max. And I'm Chris. Chris.